Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. Uh, my guest this week is Danielle Crittenden. Danielle is, uh, she co-hosted the recently retired podcast, Femsplainers with Christina Hoff Summers, um, which is a very popular podcast I've, I've listened to so many times. Um, and she's continued to write about uh, all subjects womanly on the Femsplainers substack. Um, she's also the author of multiple books, uh, including, to this conversation most relevantly, uh, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, Why Happiness Eludes the Modern Woman. And um, I, as I found out when I was uh, researching for this podcast, even a book of Polish recipes with Anne Applebaum. That's right. <laughs> a little off brand, but um, yes. I, like um, I, I got I got to get that on my bookshelf. Um, but I especially uh, wanted to get Danielle on High Noon to speak about a essay that she wrote uh, back in March, which completely went viral among my female friends titled When the Sex is Blur, there, There's No Sex. Um, we Need a New Romantic Ideal. But she she has all kinds of, uh, of of stuff to say about the modern culture between men and women, about sex, marriage, all those kinds of things. Um, so thank you so much for coming on High Noon, Danielle. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So one of the themes, I think, of this essay that you wrote that really resonated with a lot of people was this sort of um, embarrassment of being identified as feminine. Um, and this this kind of like uh, that the, the vision of femininity that is promulgated um, and the way that our culture treats femininity is is almost like there are sort of two extremes, right? You have to be there. There's a total denigration of of gentleness or of um, being too connected to people, too quote unquote sensitive, right? Um, on the one hand, for women. On the other hand, there's all these sort of, for lack of a better term, like ass kicking sort of. Um, ideals in, and you, you point to, for example, the way that Disney movies have changed. Um, you know, what, what does our culture have to say now about femininity and why, why do you worry about the fact that, um, it may not seem like much of an appealing option to, to many young women today? Well, I think it's true. And this has been true for a long time, certainly as I've come of age and written about feminism. Um, it's like, there's a, there's two views of, of or has been with the women's movement, such as it is and whatever we call it now. Um, one is that, and when I was in my 20s, um, so back in the 18, uh, sorry, <laughs> 1890s, I was, <laughs> 1980s, 1990s. Well, you, you, I must say you look excellent for your age. I, you, you know, know I do. Years. I really do for someone <laughs> born in 1890. Um, no, so there were two, there were, the, the view then was that women had to be exactly like men, not physically per se, but uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever seen the sort of 80s feminists going to work with their little, you know, uh, suits and and sort of almost pussy bow ties, and uh, we were to aspire, have the same exact aspirations as men, the same career ambitions. Uh, we weren't. It was embarrassing to um, show any kind of feminine weakness, um, and I wrote about this in my first book, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, and to admit to wanting to have children or even to get married was somehow embarrassing, that, that the, the message was, uh, you are an individual, you are capable of anything you want to be, um, and, um, and <laughs> but within a certain uh, construct that as long as it, 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 it was based on male ideas of success. Uh, males idea male ideals of a sexual um, uh, sexual lifestyle that we should just have sex with whomever we wanted uh, we sh you know uh, that that we shouldn't have any real attachments we were liberated and we didn't need men and we didn't need marriage and it was you just look weak if you sort of confessed secretly that you wanted to be married or be a mother um, or that you found sex and you know, casual sex painful or uh, demeaning or diminishing. Um, and that was very true as I came of age. And you know what? It hasn't really changed. Now um, it's still seen as kind of weak to be feminine, but it's also, we talk about toxic max masculinity, that there is, there's really no standard of how we should behave as opposite, you know, the opposite sex. And um, 
so men worry about coming off as too male or, you know, too masculine, or uh, they've seen um, regular male traits denigrated. Uh, but also as women, um, we've, you know, it's still not great to admit that you want to be married or you want to become a mother. In fact, marriage, uh, people are still doing it, but it's gone down dramatically. Um, and so, so I think there's just this mass confusion. And as we've seen the sort of rise of non-binary and adolescent girls and boys very confused about their sexuality, very depressed about whatever sex they seem to be born, that there's something wrong with it, you just see this mass confusion over what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a girl, what it means to be a boy. And yet we still very much have biological imperatives. Um, and uh, to me, it's, it's, it's sad. I think all we've done is sown confusion um, and made ourselves feel embarrassed for the biological aspirations and differences we may have as men and women. Um, you, you point out that this is, this is not new, right? Um, I mean, it may be new in the history of the world new, but, um, you know, th this doesn't start five years ago or, or 10 years ago, you know, what's the connection between the, the feminism, even of like the second wave feminists, right? Like even if you, Betty Friedan, um, or, or, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, I mean, what's, what's the connection in your view, or is there one, um, between that type of feminism and what we're seeing today, because there were kind of two camps here, right? One is um, that that quote unquote real feminism uh, opened up opportunities for women, but didn't sort of um, impose a male standard necessarily, just wanted to open opportunities. Um, and then the, the, there's the other camp that says, you know, no, these things are, are intimately connected, um, that society has to set some kind of, of message or path, even if we're tolerant of people who deviate from that path. Um, wh where do you fall on that um, sort of debate? And, and how much do you think, say, the feminism of Betty Friedan has to do with the, the problems that young women are, are facing today in, in the, the romantic and sex market? Um, mm -hmm. And and also uh, the, the debate we're now having about what biological sex even means. Right. Well, I think... Um... The post-war Betty Friedan, what is called second wave feminism. Betty Friedan, of course, uh, wrote The Feminine Mystique. She described suburban homes that women were in, uh, you know, as a concentration camp, a type of concentration camp. And you go back, and this was a very post-war phenomenon. Um, it was also uh, a phenomenon of the educated woman, uh, the middle class woman, that women have always worked. Um, and at different times and in different societies and cultures, women have taken very active roles or they've taken more domestic roles or different roles from men um, in, 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 you know, in, in the various spheres. But post-war, uh, you know, you recover from this terrible, terrible Second World War. People come back. Women have been working through the war. Men have been fighting. There's this whole new suburban world set up. And that kind of woman full time at home with her washing machine and sort of stranded in her house with children and, and you know, go to college but get an MRS degree, that was a fairly new phenomenon. So it wasn't like it had always been that way. But you can imagine, and if any of your listeners have watched Mad Men, you get the idea that, and I, re, I, I was a child in the 60s. I was born in 1963. So I have some memory of how this affected the dyna dynamism between my parents and other people's parents. But it was, um, I think it was a reaction to the war. It was a, a, a desire amongst everyone to have uh, domestic comfort. Um, and then it, it turned into this thing where women felt, you know, undervalued and trapped and men themselves felt, you know, God, I'm, I'm the breadwinner all the time. I mean, they felt trapped too. And you see on the, won't go down this road too far, but you know, the other side of the culture, the, the playboy culture, the, the, uh, Hugh Hefner culture that, that, that the sexual liberation exploded for good reasons on both sides. And women sought escape from this world uh, 
for good reasons. What I think was problematic, and if you go back to all the writings of the times of the most prominent feminists, not so much Betty Friedan, because uh, she always had time for marriage and motherhood. She actually understood um, that women were different from men, and she actually had quite a robust appreciation of men, famously. Um, but, but you know, when you got into the more um, Gloria Steinem's and, and uh, feminist writers of that time, it became very political. And one of the most famous phrases was, the personal is political. And it went from demanding equal, equal um, respect, equal opportunities, with still a rec recognition base that men and women are different, into this idea that there's a patriarchy, that uh, men are unfailingly advantaged, um, that, that women are oppressed by in this patriarchy, and there's never um, going to be escape or freedom for us unless we smash this patriarchy. And it's based on ideas like, you know, you could, you could, I remember reading these books and you could just take out patriarchy and, and put in capitalism. You know, it was a sort of Marxist idea of men and women, very politicized, but it kind of laid, um, uh, created this sense of politicization we feel now uh, that's still there between men and women that, um, you know, when you just talk casually about the patriarchy, you're making this assumption that there is this whole male system created to oppress women. And therefore, men default, any man has to be an enemy or someone regarded with suspicion. And marriage is suspicious because we, we look at it as something that the woman is then entrapped into and controlled by the man. If you stand back for five seconds, you know that this is, this is just simply not true nor is it a productive way to go about um, trying to have a relationship. I mean, you put it in very personal terms um, that you, you cannot engage with the opposite sex. And again, we're talking about heterosexual, uh, largely, couples. You cannot engage with the opposite sex if you are persuaded that at any turn um, you're going to be oppressed by your boyfriend or your husband and that uh, you are somehow innately a victim um, or has, or you have no personal agency over your situation. So that's kind of the thread that keeps on going through all the conversations uh, we're having today. Um, and that uh, we're seeing, I think, really magnified in these debates about trans where there are what, 63 genders or whatever, that we're trying, again, to deny um, any credibility to biological differences, to accept that there are biological differences. And the best way to deal with biological differences is to acknowledge them um, and, and think about how can we work with those to get the respect and equality and opportunities um, we all want as women, but without making the opposite sex the enemy also, without making the things we feel naturally as men or women somehow suspect or, um, you know, wrong um, or something we should suppress, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's funny for for a sexual liberation movement that was so worried about repression. Um, they certainly were in favor of repressing um, so many natural instincts, as you call them. But yeah, I, I was thinking as you were saying that about Simone de Beauvoir writing and lamenting the the, the very fact that you say um, is why this kind of framework of oppressor and oppressed don't it doesn't really work for men and women. She was lamenting this fact, right, saying that theoretically, for example, in in racial uh, oppression situations, the oppressed group and um, and the oppressors can separate or, or they can kill each other. Um, she said theoretically, uh, but this actually makes women in a more subordinate and more oppressed condition than in her case, I think the examples were blacks and Jews, right? Um, because they, they, uh, she didn't put it this way, but I will, but there's a lot of sleeping with the enemy. Um, and she did a lot day. of it. Let's be clear. Yeah. yeah and she did a lot <laughs> of it herself, right? And I would um, not envy her, her choice of partner. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Well, he, I, I, I have always, <laughs> I've always um, had the most contempt for how he treated her and how he treated women generally. Uh, Sart, that is, a, but but um, I, I wanted to ask you if maybe you think this is 
this problem with no name, this, you know, sort of, uh, what is it, the comfortable concentration camp of, of the home, as, as Betty Friedan wrote it. I mean, how much of this is a result of prosperity, right? You have this post-war period where America is incredibly prosperous. You point to the fact that feminism really comes and springs out of the upper classes, right? People who had enough money for a woman to be not only at home, but essentially like decorative, right? Um, mm -hmm. To have a more decorative function in society, um, which was a sign of prosperity. It strikes me that a lot of the the sort of psychological problems that arose and then, you know, were channeled, I think, I agree with you, in, inappropriately politically, um, might be faced by the whole society if, for example, uh, we, we move to a UBI system or we continue to have a system where uh, there are a few very, very um, successful tech, co tech companies, they can support a lot of people, but that, for example, a lot of other jobs, or manufacturing jobs and so on, start to, to disappear. Um, are, are we all going to face the problem with no name soon? If, 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 if part of perhaps what drove this is we've produced so much prosperity that uh, women started to feel useless um, and because their their role became more on ornamental. I mean, is, is a large part of society going to become sort of useless and ornamental uh, in the same way and have to, to grapple with the same problems of meaning as as the then feminists did in the 50s? Well, yeah, that's a that's an enormous question and one I, I can't project. I mean, let me go to your point about education. I don't think I don't think I would say that women, even in the most prosperous homes, were quote unquote decorative. What they did was they took over the whole running of the home child social life operations. There's a joke. Uh, uh, there's a it, there's a, a joke that goes uh, two men are talking and uh, one man says very proudly to the other in my house, I make all the important decisions and my wife makes all the unimportant decisions. And the other man says, well, what, what is an example of important decision? He goes, well, I decide, you know, what I think the president should do in its policy toward China and um, uh, what I, where, you know, what I think the stock market is going to do next week. Well, what are the unimportant decisions? Oh, she decides where we live, what we eat, where the kids go to school, where we vacation. <laughs> like, you know, it was a, there was a division of labor within the house and, and and it was not unmeaningful to women it, it have to stress that so, um, so I, I just want to correct for yeah. i think something that i i said and, and i can see why you think that I, I was kind of speaking in the voice of like betty for dawn right yeah. um yeah. i i don't think that they were but I, I i do think that what you pointed to earlier about um the fact that women have always worked right there was suddenly this very sort of shift if, if you could afford it right shift right. into right. um home life in a way that I don't think was just new in the 1950s was kind of new for for women and, and right. humanity generally. Right. Well, or it actually, you didn't have to be so wealthy. It was a very middle class existence, which to be have that wife at home living that life was maybe only, you know, to the very rich previously, to, you know, aristocratic society in Europe. So this idea you could be at home you could have all these amazing new, you know, machines that will do the labor for you. You don't need a maid. My my lower middle class grandmother in rural Australia had a maid. You know, it it, it, it was. And speaking of becoming um, societies where things get me mechanized, you know, like well, now that you have this washing machine and this vacuum cleaner and all this, you don't need a maid. And and so these otherwise pretty educated women were finding themselves doing all these chores. So there were whole seismic shifts at that time. But um, the role of the woman primarily doing the home and the man uh, doing the work, that was, that was, that happened. Um, but fast forwarding, uh, what is interesting now and remains true is that the very wealthy, I, th I forget now how we define it, whether it's households earning more than a quarter of a million or $400,000 or whatever, but the wealthier women and the most educated women are the ones most likely to drop out of the workforce. Um, so, so it's like when a woman gets married and is well-to-do, she's going to take that time out and, and raise her kids. Because why? Because not everyone has amazing career ambitions. That is a very, you know, elite thing. 
And work today for most women is being like a cashier um, at Walmart. And most jobs for men involve trucking. You know, these are not what one would say are called fulfilling careers. Um, and and that's, those are the people who have, I think, been very shortchanged by the, the, you know, the collapse of marriage, the collapse of sharing lives and, and dividing, you know, tasks. Um, so, so coming to the future, yeah, there's going to be a real problem when we no longer need, need, need cashiers where everything is self-checkout, where we no longer need truckers because, you know, whatever, self-driving trucks, whatever, you don't need, you don't need those jobs anymore. Yeah, there's going to be, and we're seeing it already, you know, a huge um, effect on those kind of working class areas. Uh, but for women who um, are educated, I mean, I find it just insane that we have never, and corporations don't work harder to provide their children, their workers with childcare. And I don't mean like, you know, state paid for or, you know, 24 hour, but it, that, that I think because the discussion around feminist, feminism and by feminists themselves have been so unaccommodating in many ways to women and children. And there's been no, I think it was Helen Joyce who said she was on the podcast and she said, what I've always been struck by American feminism is how little materially it got. It got a lot of uh, lip service, but unlike in other, other countries in Europe, they, they literally have no kind of proper parental leave, maternity leave, uh, very little is done in terms of providing childcare to which you think would be helpful. And, you know, other societies have their own problems and, and, and these are costly programs, but it is amazing to me. And post pandemic will be interesting to see what happens, how, how just little support there is to help both fathers and mothers raise children. Um, and, um, and, and anyway, that's, that's something that I think is so important, but I think also comes out of this idea that, well, if you start acknowledging that it's mostly going to be women who need the help, um, well, we, can't, we can't accept that. It, 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 it has to apply equally to both sexes, uh, and it's not something you hear a lot about these days. Yeah, I was going to say that the two things that we hear the most about in response to the very problem that you're you know, bringing up is... You know, from the corporate side, freeze your eggs, right? That you see all the Silicon Valley companies now offering women basically to put off having children right. so they can continue to be workers in Silicon Valley. And and then um, you know, on on the flip side, um just like I don't know, we, we have some proposals at IWF to to, for example, to be able to cash social security as maternity leave and then delay retirement on the on the flip side, which I think is a really flexible sort of way of dealing with this. But I think what you're pointing to is the real problem and why we don't really address one of the this problem in a, a like substantive way. I don't think it's just money. I mean, we spend money on so many things. Um, I, I I think it's because nobody wants to acknowledge, at least nobody who is pushing these programs wants to acknowledge that it's going to be women primarily using them. And in fact, you have, um, I can't remember if it was Amanda Marcotte or um, someone someone like Amanda Mercat, but some, some slate piece that was writing, basically, we have to be very careful about how um, we talk about parental leave, how we talk about um, especially maternal leave, because these, these ideas reinforce the stereotype that it should be the women who are staying right. home. Well, the reality is most women, when they have kids, I mean, still into surveys today, right, um, mm -hmm. say that they prefer to work part time or not at all when they have young children. This is this is a biological reality that you're it's right. also, I think it's it's also not a bad thing. It's a, it's a good yeah. thing. Like I remember writing um, in, in my book, like, and I was, um, I had a baby at my our first child at tw age 28, which back then this would have been 1991 was, I, I was like alone. I knew one other contemporary who was having a baby. Um, so you just felt like some Martian. Uh, but as, and, and going into it, I was very modern. I thought, okay, well, I'm lucky I'm a writer so I can work from home. But, you know, I had this whole notion of how it was going to go and 
I was going to split the chores with my husband and blah, 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 blah. You have a baby and it hits you like a truck and in a good way, not like a bad way, but it just, it completely changes your notions of uh, biological differences and, and different desires between like the mother and the father. And um, I just remember thinking, reading about the time that, that, that the feminist movement at that time was saying, you know, the minute, if you, if you have a baby, the first thing you should do is put it right into daycare. We need daycare for newborns. And you were the mother and you have this new incredible creature in your arms. And it's funny, but the first impulse, no matter how ambitious you are, your first impulse is not to stick it <laughs> in daycare. <laughs> like you want, you actually want to be with your kids crazy. Um, and especially when they're young. And, and so the idea that we have not made this easier for women um, and, and it also goes, as you say, to this concept that uh, feminism, even today, um, describes female se success in terms of these quotas, like there still aren't 50-50 women CEOs and, you know, the, you know, there aren't as many women scientists in this. And not, and it, again, it just shows a complete failure or lack of desire to look at the reasons behind why women aren't meeting those. And it's not just sexism, you know, it's not just the patriarchy. Women are making choices um, based on, on, on real, you know, their desire to be with their children, to not consign them uh, to, to daycare the minute they are born. And I've, I've often thought that, um, that having, on-site daycare for a company, you know, especially as I've watched, I've now gone through the full cycle of motherhood. My last kid just went to college uh, last fall. That that if you have on-site company, I mean, how much does that cost, you know, versus losing women? And the idea that you as a mother, once your kid is three or four, could just go down and, and be with them, or, you know, it, it's so easy, it seems, um, so natural. Uh, but, and you'll see these modern workplaces get pool tables and ping pong tables and video games and, and say, aren't we great? But why not a playroom with two staffers? You know, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I think, I think that is a, that is a big failure of uh, the organized women's movement to, to push for those things for the reasons, you know, you say. Do you, do you think that, do you think we can have um, a societal message that because it seems to me the problem you're describing is that essentially the quote unquote women's movement is trying to solve problems for a small minority of women who are primarily primarily in sort of the creative classes. They're primarily they do see their their work as somehow like I identity rather than mm -hmm. or a career rather than like working at the checkout line, right? They're not they're yes, money is important, but they also have a sense of identity wrapped up in it. Um, and it seems like so much of the discourse, you're right, is 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 aimed at this small percentage of women and it forgets the, you know, 80 or 90 percent of women who would, one, mostly are working for money, not for career mm -hmm. identity. And and two are you know, would would love to be able to um, stay home or to have on site daycare, which I think is a really great idea to be able to spend more time with their children, not less. Um, do you think. So we kind of have a script that makes these things when you talk about the, the video games and the ping pong tables and stuff. We have a, we have now a societal script. If you are doing, quote unquote, well in life, if you're ambitious, you will do well in K-12. You will go to a university. You'll graduate from university, maybe do some um, postgraduate work, right? Whether that's getting you know a, a doctoral degree, whatever. Um, and then you will go to work in, in the professional class and, and you will probably end up moving around quite a bit in your 20s. So maybe you're looking for a partner. If you're lucky, you're starting to look for a partner at 25 um, in a serious way where you stop moving around. If you're continuing your academic work, um, maybe not until 30, right? Uh, and then you have to find somebody that you actually, you know, like enough to to marry and um, likes you enough to marry. Um, and and then you want to be alone for a few years. And then, like it, it, it pushes having kids to the very sort of end of the biological spectrum where it's possible. Mm -hmm. Um I would call that a script, right? Mm -hmm. That that 
that's the reason that these companies think they attract people by putting, you know, in the ping pong table is because we the, have the, the beer, you know, the, that that on 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 demand beer. Uh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on tap, yeah. Um, I, I once went to a party that had Prosecco on tap, which was really fun, which I've wow. never seen before. <laughs> I hope anyway. there was a party and not a workplace because I can't imagine anything yeah. getting done. done. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there is a script, whether we sort of like it or not. We couch it in this idea of, of individualized liberation, but the reality is that, you know, society is sending out a message, which again, you point to in, sorry, that's my dog. Hopefully you can't, nobody can hear that. But, I cannot um, hear your dog. <laughs> Uh, but, but so, you know, there is a script that is, is, is the sort of correct path. Um, and it's couched as individual, but it's really not, I mean, we are giving a very strong message. And my question is, do you think a true neutrality is one desirable or two possible? Like, is there, is it possible to have a society that doesn't deliver a script? And if, if not, if, if yes, then that'll be interesting enough. And then if, if not, you know, why are we setting the script for the 10% rather than the 90%, right? Why, why isn't the script have kids young, then, you know, you, you can always, you know, you can always work when your kids are a little older. Um, it's, it's, it just, it doesn't, this academic script only makes sense for a small percentage of people, but it seems like we're pushing it on women. And there's a lot of unhappiness that results from that. Right. And when you look at the explosion of single motherhood, um, single parent families in, in our generation, um, the women at Walmart are probably the most in dire need of some sort of, you know, help with, with daycare at their jobs. If you want to, you know, labor shortage, if you want to, and maybe this post pandemic labor shortage will lead companies like Walmart to, to say, God, we really need these people. We need to pay them more and we need to help them out in these ways. Um, but in terms of a script, uh, yeah, I mean, is it a script? Is it just now the way we do things, the way we've been taught to think about things? I mean, I have two daughters. Uh, one is 30. Uh, the other is 20. Um, and they both went through, you know, their teenage years. And my, my younger is a Gen Z or so, you know, she had what we're seeing, um, you know, Instagram, social media was always part of her life. She always, um, the internet was always present. And I think that that has had a real effect as we're seeing on um, how uh, young women perceive and how young men perceive sex should go. Uh, that I just remember telling both my daughters and most recently my younger daughter, they'd come home from a party and there were expectations that they should behave like porn stars, really. Um, and it was all going the men's way, like like girls were being pulled off into rooms and performing at oral sex and thinking that this was some sort of liberation. And I remember speaking to one of my daughters who was like embarrassed that she didn't want to be doing this. And as far as I know, she didn't thank God because I was saying like, how degrading is that? Is that liberation? Are you, you know, when you look back when you're 25 and see this and, and by then maybe you have a real, really good relationship. Is, is this how, what you want to remember that you did? It was just, and I, I was able to point out to them that this was not about um, fulfilling your desires or behaving the way you wanted to behave or having the relationships you wanted to have. Uh, this was, pure exploitation, pure degradation. Um, and not that I was against sex, but this is how no one should have to experience sex. Uh, if, if you're going to wake up the next day and be, be just miserable, which these girls were. So, but, but the odd thing was that they, in their milieu, they were not getting this message. And even from their own mothers that, um, you know, you don't have to do this. You you should date intentionally. That's always been my rule. You date with a purpose. You you don't just bounce from one relationship to the next like a pinball. Don't be embarrassed that you want a serious relationship. Don't be embarrassed that you want a relationship that will eventually lead to marriage. What is my behavior? What am I doing? Is this going to help me get to where I want to be? 
when I'm 30 or 40. So to, to look at things in the long term, understand your sexual behavior may well differ a lot from men. Understanding what young men want from, you know, a relationship. I remember saying, I don't know, she was 15 or 16. It's just like, do you think this guy actually wants a relationship? Like, what does that even mean right now? Like, you're going to go to the movies? Like, what, what is, what is it but just having sex at this point? And, um, and so, so, so you're, you're having to try, make these young women see the long game. And then I would hope, and I'm a mother of a son also, the men, young men have to be taught that, you know, I, I don't care if you've watched Pornhub since you were eight years old, you know, that's not real. That's not how men treat women. That's, that's, you should not have these expectations that your sex life is going to be like Pornhub. Um, so it's, you know, we're dealing with so many new factors uh, and pressures on these uh, younger men and women. But on the other hand, they're not getting any kind of message that validates the way they should behave in their own interests, um, that validates the differences they may experience when having sex, um, or that even that it's even wrong or somehow sexist to think there are sexes different sexes uh, or prejudiced. Um, and, and it's, and all you look out there and then throw in dating apps, which to me just seem like the most depressing thing on earth. I mean, I like online shopping as much as the next person, but the idea of just going through these, you know, person after person after person after person and I, I joked to my eldest daughter, I said, you know, if apps were around when I met your dad, we, we never would have met. We never would have, our algorithms would never have come across each other's screen. So you've just pulled everything away from real life, real interaction, real expectations. Um, and, and there's no, I guess, if not script, there's no dialogue that allows us to talk about these things with any frankness um, on any large scale. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think it gets channeled into one of the interesting things right now is, is that we're seeing a horseshoe effect. I think we're, we're finally coming to the, the realization both on the left and the right part of the political spectrum that the current sex relations are messed up in some way. So that's the sort of the good part. But what I'm worried about is that it'll just be channeled into a type of legalism or, you know, um, anti-male sentiment, right? Because that's kind of what I'm, I'm saying. That's, Me Too was really a turning point for all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the driving force behind Me Too is exactly what you're describing. It's just that women were unhappy with their sort of sexual encounters, with the way that men were treating them, with how they felt, but they had absolutely no vocabulary as to how to talk about sex outside of consent because the only way and that we were able to and judge power. sex was whether it's good if it was consensual it's bad if it wasn't right, right. and i mean and the man was is always presumed to have the power i mean when me too happened i mean i grew up i literally grew up in a newsroom all my parents were journalists father stepmother mother stepfather so i i quite literally grew up in a newsroom um and um you know, there were a lot of encounters and that and ways of doing things that and, and then I was a reporter um, in the 80s. And, you know, you look back on some things that happen and and the things that were said to you, things were, like they were so wrong and inappropriate, especially by today's standards. And at the time you just went, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's what happens. And that's wrong. And so there was a lot about me too that I appreciated. And if it were about um, not having these kinds of improper um, relationships, improper comments, improper treatment at work, you know, that it's, it's not always a legal issue, you know, and it's not always about consent. But as you point out, we've also seen this used in a way that is very familiar, actually, going back to Andrea Dworkin, where... Um, this was in the 90s that women 
were similarly seen as having a complete lack of agency, always victims. My my friend Christina Summers and colleague calls it, you know, fainting couch feminism, that that if a man were to look at you funny or um, say, a, you know, dirty joke that, oh, my God, you're so I can't take a faint. And <laughs> and there's and there's a little bit about this um, with me, too, um, where. It's 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 not to excuse unwanted sexual behavior. It's not to excuse rude jokes, but we're we're getting to a situation, and especially we've seen this on college campuses, where women are denying their own agency. So if you get unbelievably drunk, well, you, you know this. This is very familiar. The guy gets unbelievably drunk, and something happens. Uh, you can't automatically presume that the man is, you know, that, that, that it's all his fault and he should have um, been able to think through his actions better than you were at a similar level of in, in talk, you know, intoxication. But we, we can't really, it's been hard to talk about that. I think that's changing a little. I mean, even if you just go by popular culture and you look at um, shows on Netflix and things where, women they're they're making the situation muddier the man is now you know no longer presumed automatically guilty i mean i think we're we're all talking through that and working through that but any presumption that doesn't allow for a woman's self or her own responsibility her own agency um is infantilizing to the woman that if we're going to be equal and cope in this world we also have to take responsibility for our actions, and we also have to not constantly see ourselves as victims of some larger male control system over in which we're helpless. It doesn't help anybody, and it certainly doesn't help women. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things I've noticed is that people who hold this view of like the systemic oppression of women and, and really do view sex relations through that lens. They rarely say that about their grandmothers, right? And by all objective measures, right? Um, their grandmothers lived under uh, a different regime in terms of, of legal rights or um, other, other um, sort of quote unquote advancements of feminism. But very few people say that their grandmothers were doormats. Yeah. Um, that's or kind that of an they, interesting. Right. Or that they, one of the great gifts my mother gave to me was um, that, that she, she was very emphatic that, and she worked, she was a reporter. She worked through my childhood, but we were, when um, she stayed home when my el older brother and I were, were very young at a great financial cost, by the way, that being a reporter back then was being like a very working class job, very low pay. My dad was um, an editor, um, you know, copy editor, news editor, but these were not big salaries. So when she cut out for a few years while we were young, it had a, you know, we were, we were pretty, I would say lower, 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 lower middle class. You know, we had, we had a small house, but we really had, there were real sacrifices that they made economically. But she always would say to me as I was growing up, she would say, you know, you obviously want to do something and you don't want to be bored and you it's important that you have a career or follow your aspirations. But also motherhood was just one of the greatest things I've ever done. You know, those years I stayed with you when you were little were just magical. I was, we had such a good time together and, and, and I hope you meet someone, you know, I was lucky to meet whom I love. And by the way, when you're 16, I'm getting you birth control because you're going to want to have sex and, sex is fun and sex is love. You know, she had this very positive attitude towards everything. And it's sad to me now how sex should be a wonderful experience with someone who is meaningful to you. And when you deprive it of that meaning, when you make it like the gateway drug to any future encounter, when it's the first thing you do with someone and it's not, the ultimate expression of your f intimacy with someone, you've deprived it of its meaning. Um, and when you look around, you see, you don't see, you know, very few people are happy about it. It's fraught. Um, uh, and, and the same with motherhood or parenthood, you know, we've, we've made it look 
so terrible and, and seem like such a burden. Um, and, and I think that's just so profoundly sad and is also just bad for us as a society. I mean, the world has to be peopled. Women, by and large, want to have good relationships, loving relationships. Men, by and large, want to have good and loving relationships. And we've just seemed to make it so difficult, make the simplest things so difficult, so fraught, so politicized, that I just, I despair for, um, you know, uh, these these younger men and women. Yeah, you know, one of the things, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s now, I'm 34, but, um, you know, I expected to feel a certain amount of, like, jealousy, right, as, as you clearly sort of age out of the, like, 20s demographic and stuff, and I find myself more often filled with kind of sadness and pity for <laughs> Um, which shouldn't be right. Like we, you know, we should, we should look back fondly and say like, oh, that was so much fun to be, you know, young and, and, um, but I, I find myself more and more very grateful that I got out of the dating market in 2011 because it seems just so depressing in many ways. But you, so you write in this piece, um, which I think is connected to what we're talking about here, that we have no cultural narrative for a romantic ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you write, you connect it to some of the the sort of pop cultural messages around this. You say, while these feminist vision uh, versions of princesses, and you're referring here to sort of what I called earlier the kick-ass version, right? The 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 girl who saves the boy, right? Um, right. The prince can no longer save the princess. Uh, the princess has to save the prince, and then they can only then can they live happily ever after. Yeah, so you say that um, these princesses might have been more impressive female role models than their predecessors, uh, meaning the ones that were saved by princes. They did not offer any more satisfactory guide to navigating modern romance. In the end, these tales proved every bit as formulaic and unrealistic as the ones they sought to replace. You continue a bit later. Belle wasn't faced to le uh, left to face her 30s alone, slinging beers in the local tavern, while Prince Charming swiped right on Tinder. Um, is there any... Do do you have it's, it's and it's a big question and I, I you know there's no way really to predict but do you have any like sort of sense or clue about what the elements of sort of punching through to the other side of the sexual revolution might look like because as we've talked about I think everyone is kind of unhappy about it um there there are sort of um there are elements that will we'll, we'll, um, deal with it in completely different ways and then I think in some very destructive ways that'll make it worse but um you know, do you have any any thoughts about how we might be able to punch through or get out of this kind of end point? It seems like this is sort of a terminus point in many ways of the sexual revolution. And what comes afterwards is going to be have to be by necessity something new. It's hard to say because my husband actually once had a great line. He says, children are deaf, but they see everything. Um, and I think that I don't know about your background, Inez, but um, my own background, even though my parents uh, got divorced, but my mother, we remarried very happily and really phenomenal marriage. My husband came from a phenomenal marriage uh, and, and, and phenomenal in every aspect of the word, the world, word that, that, that my mother, his mother, his mother was a very famous uh, Canadian broadcaster. So she was like, she was like a totally modern feminist icon, although she was once asked by an interviewer, uh, do you ever dream of being single again? And she goes, well, I have nightmares about it. Um, so even this great icon saw the value of family and marriage and, and, and both our parents' case, they were very equal marriages. They had respect, they had real love for each other. Um, and if you, if, if you haven't seen that or experienced that, you know, you it, it's it's hard to imagine that it exists. Um, I think I've been very lucky in my marriage. You know, I could come up with all kinds of ideas of why it worked or pro tips or whatever. But in the end, I feel so much of it was like, but so much of it was being open to being with someone and loving them and being on both sides unselfish and giving the other the benefit of the doubt and and treating each other like equals and partners, especially when you become parents. If you don't see that, if you don't have that idea in your head, if you're um, if you're not open 
to giving and risking, actually, if you're not open to risking trust and intimacy with someone, you are never going to have it. And I think that's the toughest thing that I see around us and young women, young men with very, very good reason don't trust the opposite sex. Uh, men think they're going to get burned in many ways. Women think they are and, and both get burned in many ways. Um, and I think people stop putting themselves out for the other. Uh, a very good point I'm reading in this book, I think we mentioned just before I came on, Christine Emba, uh, Rethinking Sex, which is very interesting. She made this point that with um, online dating, uh, when you stop dating with within an actual community, i.e., oh, my friend set me up with so-and-so or her boyfriend's best friend, uh, when it's just somebody you meet at a bar with no mutual connection, no background, it's you are more likely to behave badly or cruelly or selfishly because you have, even if you're not that type of person, because you have nothing invested in it. It's like the way people on Twitter behave, you know, that they'll, they'll say these horrible, insulting things. But if you were to meet them in person, they would go, oh, well, I, I, I'm not like that. I would, you know, I would never say that to your face. And so I think this dating culture in the absence of any kind of mutual community um, is, is very problematic. And then people do treat each other much, much worse. Um, you know, they ghost, uh, they, they say things via text that they shouldn't say. It, it's, and it's sad. And you, you, there's no getting around it. It's here. This is how people are meeting people today. But it's to be self-aware that people are not just commodities. They're not just faces on an app. The people are people. And in order to have a successful relationship, you're going to have to be open. Um, you're going to have to be open and trusting and willing to put yourself on the line for someone else and someone worthy of that. And the trick is, of course, finding someone who is worthy of that. But it is, it is a problem. And I think unless today, unless you've grown up with it, unless you've seen it, unless you've experienced it, 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 it's very easy to believe that that fairy tale ending or that true romance or love that endures does not exist. Well, on on that relatively positive <laughs> note, that it that it does, um, Danielle, thank you so much for for spending this hour with us on on High Noon. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to Inez at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or iwf.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.